there is nothing more familiar or more mysterious, more breathtaking in its action, marvelous in its mechanics, exquisite in its range of senses, and staggering in its ability to understand. On a fantastic voyage through a single day, we plunge deep into the routine miracles of the human body. Our instruments, engines, infrastructure, roadways and circuitry. Through 10,000 blinks, 20,000 breaths, 100,000 beats. Today is an ordinary, extraordinary day in the life of the incredible human machine. Bits of stardust is really all we are. Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and a handful of elements that would cost very little at any chemical supply shop. But get these chemicals together, marinate in a hospitable place for about 3.8 billion years, and the mundane mix of molecules becomes precious. There are more than six billion human bodies living on Earth, and each of us is the amalgamation of some 100 trillion microscopic cells. While the blueprint for each individual are 99.9% .9 identical, no two of us are exactly the same. As a new day dawns, each human machine begins the succession of miracles that will take it from morning to midnight. Cells, senses, muscles, Bones, hearts, brains, all must marshal their forces and unite just to wake us up. Deep within each of the body's hundred billion cells is a complete blueprint for a human being, a genome. Here our DNA molecules are tightly packaged into bundles called chromosomes. Each cell has 23 pairs of chromosomes. Biotechnology capitalizes on the attributes of cells. In spite of the extraordinary diversity of cell types in living things, what is most striking is their remarkable similarity. This unity of life at the cellular level provides the foundation for biotechnology. All cells have the same basic design are made of the same construction materials and operate using essentially the same processes. DNA, the genetic material of almost all living things, directs cell construction and operation, while proteins do all the work. Now that we've familiarized ourselves with the structure of a cell, let's peek inside the nucleus and look at the structure of DNA. The chromosomes in the nucleus are highly coiled and condensed packages of DNA. When you zoom in on DNA, you can see that the DNA is arranged into functional units called genes. The Human Genome Project discovered that humans have approximately 20,000 genes on chromosomes. These genes are made up of individual DNA units called nucleotides, arranged in a specific sequence unique to each gene. Chromosomes, genes, and nucleotides are all DNA. They are just different levels of organization for the DNA. Let me see if I can explain that better. To use an analogy, it's like a book. The book is divided into functional units called chapters, and the chapters are made up of individual words. Chromosomes are divided into functional units called genes, which are made up of individual nucleotides. It was not until the mid-1900s that DNA was elucidated as the inherited material described in Gregor Mendel's P studies. Many scientists contributed to the current DNA knowledge, but most notably, Rosalind Franklin used X-ray crystallography to generate beautiful pictures of the DNA molecule. 
Watson and Crick studied these pictures, and along with all the data that had been collected from previous experiments, published a paper in 1953 describing the structure of the DNA molecule. Let's look at the structure that Watson and Crick described. Remember that a nucleotide is the smallest unit of a DNA molecule. There are three components to a nucleotide. The deoxyribose sugar, shown in blue, is a five carbon ring. Although only the fifth carbon is shown, you can see that a carbon is represented by the meeting of two lines on the pentose ring. The carbons are numbered clockwise, starting from the central oxygen. The phosphate group bonds to the fifth carbon. Also notice that on the third carbon, there is a hydroxyl or OH group. We'll discuss this in just a minute. The nitrogen base, shown in orange, is on carbon number one. There are four nitrogen bases in DNA. They are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Those four nitrogen bases are actually divided into two different classes. The purines have double rings and are made up of adenine and guanine. The pyrimidines have a single ring and are made up of thymine and cytosine. DNA is a double-stranded molecule. Notice that adenine, A, forms bonds with thymine, T, and guanine, G, forms bonds with cytosine, C. The bonds that hold these two strands of DNA together are highlighted in light blue and are called hydrogen bonds. These hydrogen bonds give DNA its characteristic helical shape. Also, if you know the sequence of DNA on one strand of DNA, you can figure out the sequence of the other strand because A always pairs with T and G always pairs with C. Therefore, the two strands are called complementary. There is another kind of bond, the bond that holds the nucleotides together on the single strand of the DNA molecule. Remember when we looked at the phosphate on the fifth carbon and the OH on the third carbon of a nucleotide? Well, look closely and you'll see how the phosphate group on one nucleotide has formed a bond with the OH group on the nucleotide above it. This is called a phosphodiester bond, and these bonds are highlighted in yellow. The alternating string of sugar and phosphate bonds form the backbone of the DNA strand. One more thing. Notice that on one strand of the DNA molecule, the phosphate, or 5' prime end, is on top, and the OH, or 3' prime end, is on the bottom. What do you notice about the complementary strands of DNA? That's right, it's the mirror image. So on the complementary strand, the OH, or 3' prime end, is up, and the phosphate, or 5' prime end is down. Because of the opposite direction of the strands, they are called anti-parallel. This is going to become very important when we study how DNA replicates. Now that you understand the structure of DNA, we'll examine how the DNA information is made into proteins. Let's begin by examining the structure of RNA. RNA nucleotides are very similar to DNA nucleotides. However, there are some very important differences. First, the four bases in RNA are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and no, not thymine, but uracil. The second difference is found on the number two carbon. Do you see the purple highlighted hydroxyl group? This extra OH makes it difficult for RNA to form hydrogen bonds with adjacent nucleotides. That's why RNA is almost always single-stranded. And because it is single-stranded and represents only small sections of the DNA, RNA can leave the nucleus through small nuclear pores and travel into the cytoplasm where it is used as a template to make proteins. There are three types of RNA to be discussed. Let's define them. Messenger RNA, or mRNA, is shown in purple and is the copy of RNA that is made directly from the DNA sequence. The next two RNAs are necessary for making protein. Ribosomal RNA, or rRNA, is shown in brown and along with proteins is what makes up the ribosomes. Do you remember what happens at the ribosomes? That's right, ribosomes are where proteins are made. The last type of RNA, called transfer RNA, or tRNA, is shown in green, and it functions to bring amino acids to the ribosomes for protein assembly. The manipulation of genetic information, specifically DNA and RNA, is at the center of most biotechnology research and development. Modifications can be as simple as changing a single nitrogen base, G, A, T, or C, in a gene sequence, or as complicated as cutting out entire genes or gene sections and inserting new ones. Changing DNA sequences may affect the characteristics of cells or whole organisms. 
The DNA double helix contains two linear sequences of the letters A, C, G, and T, which carry coded instructions. Transcription of DNA begins with a bundle of factors assembling at the start of a gene to read off the information that will be needed to make a protein. The blue molecule is unzipping the double helix and copying one of the two strands. The yellow chain sneaking out of the top is a close chemical cousin of DNA called RNA. The building blocks to make the RNA enter through an intake hole. They are matched to the DNA letter by letter to copy the gene. At this point, the RNA needs to be edited before it can be translated into a protein. This editing process is called splicing, which involves removing the green, non-coding regions called introns, leaving only the yellow, protein-coding exons. Splicing begins with assembly of factors at the intron-exon borders, which act as beacons to guide small proteins to form a splicing machine called the spliceosome. The animation is showing this happening in real time. The spliceosome then brings the exons on either side of the intron very close together, ready to be cut. One end of the intron is cut and folded back on itself to join and form a loop. The spliceosome then cuts the RNA to release the loop and join the two exons together. The edited RNA and intron are released and the spliceosome disassembles. This process is repeated for every intron in the RNA. Numerous spliceosomes remove all introns so that the edited RNA contains only exons, which are the complete instructions for the protein. Again, this is happening in real time. When the RNA copy is complete, it snakes out into the outer part of the cell. Once a gene has been located and transcribed into mRNA, it must first be edited before it can be translated into a protein. This editing process is called splicing. It involves removing non-coding regions called introns, leaving only the protein coding exons. In the cell, the introns are removed by special enzymes which recognize specific sequences. These enzymes cut and rejoin the coding regions for translation into protein. Then all the components of a molecular factory called a ribosome lock together around the RNA. It translates the genetic information in the RNA into a string of amino acids that will become a protein. Special transfer molecules, the green triangles, bring each amino acid to the ribosome. Inside the ribosome, the RNA is pulled through like a tape. There are different transfer molecules for each of the 20 amino acids shown as small red tips. The code for each amino acid is read off the RNA three letters at a time and matched to three corresponding letters on the transfer molecules. The amino acid is added to the growing protein chain and after a few seconds the protein starts to emerge from the ribosome. Ribosomes can make many proteins. It just depends what genetic message you feed into the RNA. We inch one step closer to understanding how it all works and how far we still have to go. I think that as you learn, you know, where vision is and where I control my hand from, and where my speech is located, you begin to feel like I'm understanding this circuitry and I think I understand how the brain works. And then you get into it a little more deeply and you realize you don't know very much at all. That the wonder of the human brain is sort of one of these great frontiers. That's the truth. The more you learn, the dumber you realize you are. <laughs> The same applies to all parts of the incredible machine. Whether it's our control center or pumping station, our security or exhaust system, our power plants or copying machines, the human body has been a marvel of complexity for more than a hundred thousand years. From its surface to its core, amongst its billions of cells, and throughout its roadways and circuitry. At the end of the day, somehow all of these systems converge into one truly incredible design. Even while we sleep, our bodies are always working, always breathing, always beating, always ready to begin another day.
And though there may be an infinite number of species born of stars long gone, we can all rest easy knowing there is nothing quite like the incredible human machine.